Good morning. I'm Jackson Grayson. This is my mom, Natalie, and my brother, Julian. And I'm here to read scripture this morning. Um, our morning's readings come from Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. The Lord tells us, Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if, it is, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. And if they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. All right. When everything is wrong, God invites us to hope. When Christmas doesn't feel like Christmas, Christ offers us true peace that needs no decoration. Fill our hearts with your peace, Lord. When light shines, we see the truth. Joy bursts into our lives, enlarging our hearts. Unexpected joy is the best kind. May holy joy fill our hearts today and always. Will you pray with me? God of surprises who desires your people to know joy, enlarge our hearts and open our eyes to what you are about so that we may rejoice in the life and work of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. But this morning, um, we are wrapping up our, our series that we've been in for this four Sundays of our Advent journey. Um, and, and we've been looking at this book um, called The Heart That Grew Three Sizes, Finding Faith in the Story of the Grinch. Uh, most of us know this, this, this book, um, or you've either read it or you've watched some version of the movie, either the original movie version that's short or, you know, the Jim Carrey version or the newer cartoon. Um, but in this, in this story, we have the, the villain character, right? But it's a, it's a story of transformation. It's a story that takes us from a place of, of hate and a, a place of, of evil into a place of reconciliation. And friends, this is exactly what the Christmas story is all about. If we read the entire biblical narrative— Starting in Genesis, we see a world that although it was created good, sin enters into that world. And brokenness, brokenness between humanity and God, brokenness between humanity and creation, brokenness between humanity and itself. But Jesus, when Jesus entered the world... Jesus came as one of us, right? Jesus came to save all of us. And that's the beauty of the Christmas story, a story of redemption, a story of reconciliation, a story where God's intended creation is restored. Over the past several weeks, we've kind of read different snippets of The Grinch. Um, we're going to continue reading just a little bit today. Uh, but last week, if you were here, um, you remember the, the Grinch succeeded in stealing Christmas, 
right? And Cindy Lou Who is just kind of standing there like, why are you taking all of my presents, right? <laughs> and he tells her, tells her a little lie, well, a big lie, uh, and then goes up the tree. And so as the story continues, it says this, 3,000 feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip top to dump it. Poo-poo to the who's was the grinchy Lee humming. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two. Then the who's down in Whoville will cry, boo-hoo. That noise, grinned the Grinch, that, that I simply must hear. So he paused, and the Grinch put his hand on his ear, and he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, and then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why? It sounded merry. It couldn't be, but it was merry very. He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook, and what he saw was a surprise. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, they were singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came, somehow or another, just the same. The Grinch goes up to the top of Mount Crumpet, and he has this grand plan that he's going to dump all of the presents, and he, he knows that this is about the time that the, the kids are waking up, right? We all know what that feels like on Christmas morning. We're all trying to sleep, and they want to open presents. The pitter-patter of their little feet comes running down the hallway, and he imagines that they're going to start crying, which is exactly what my children would do if everything just disappeared. But instead, he hears a noise that's not sad, it's joyful, and the who's are singing. Christmas was not what he expected it to be at all. Has anyone else had a Christmas where it wasn't what they expected it to be? Like perhaps you put a lot of thought into a present and, and the person receiving it opens and just kind of goes, huh, right? <laughs> Either what's that or why would you buy that for me, right? Or perhaps you've invested a large amount of money in some sort of play apparatus um, and your children open it and they love it and then they immediately start playing with the box and the wrapping paper and you're like, why did I spend all of these funds? right? Or maybe you had an accident and broke your foot, <laughs> and now you're not going to be able to do all the things you wanted to do on Christmas, right? Sometimes things aren't what we expect. Sometimes, no matter how much planning we put in, no matter what we do, Christmas doesn't turn out like it's supposed to. And this is kind of what happens to the Grinch, although his plan is the opposite, right? He's not trying to plan joy. He's trying to, to sow some despair. But as the story goes on and the Who's start singing, something interesting happens to the Grinch. It says, and the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could this be so? It came without ribbons, it came without tags, it came without packages, packages, boxes, or bags, and then he puzzled for three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't thought of before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light, and he brought back all of the toys and the food for the feast, and he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. It's the end of the story, right? He's transformed, his heart grows, and he's able to sit at the table with the rest of the Who's. Now, we don't know exactly why, what he heard transformed his heart, but we know it was some kind of song. For many of you in this room, uh, music is what drives you on Sunday morning. 
Music is what kind of brings us together. It wouldn't matter really what I said on Sunday morning. Uh, the, the, some of the feeling that you get comes from the music that we sing. These songs of joy cultivate these feelings in our hearts that often inspire us, that move us to tears, that bring us to our knees, that allow us to humble ourselves before God in ways that we could have never imagined before. And I don't have to tell you that. I, I, I can only imagine what it would feel like to come to Christmas Eve service this Saturday and not sing any songs, for it literally to be a silent night, right? That would not be what we would want, right? Because this music, these songs, fill and shape our hearts. The Christmas story is also full of music. Even though it's words on a page and there are no notes or stanzas, but there are songs. The first song that we hear, we actually get two in Luke's first chapter. The first is Mary's song. And then if you keep reading a story that we, a song that we don't often read, and we're not going to read it this morning either, um, is Zechariah's song. He sings a song of joy as well, uh, which is interesting because we hear that when he is told that his wife Elizabeth is going to have a baby, he kind of like, is like, what? Like, that's not possible. You know, we're really old. Old people can't have babies. You know, there's this whole menopause thing, like, doesn't really, have you ever heard menopause from a pulpit on Sunday morning? Probably not. <laughs> um, but uh, he's like, yeah, that's, that's not really going to happen. And then he becomes mute, right? Like, he can't speak. And so in this moment, he's able to sing and to proclaim. That's the first thing that he does. It's like Ariel in The Little Mermaid, right? The second she gets her voice back, she starts singing. Zechariah is the same way. We should do the Christmas according to the Little Mermaid next year. <laughs> but when Mary and Elizabeth meet, and they, uh, Mary has been told by the angel that she is about to have the Son of God, that she's about to birth into the world the light of God. She goes and she tells her cousin, right, Elizabeth, who also should not be pregnant because she's very old. And it says when, when Mary kind of is, is there, the, the, the baby in Elizabeth's womb, who is John the Baptist, kicks her, right? If you've ever been pregnant, you know what that feeling is like, right? Sometimes it's joyful. Other times you're like, get out of my ribs, kid, right? But in that moment, Elizabeth feels this baby kick, and there's this sense of joy that surrounds them. And Mary can't do anything but sing. And the song she sings we call the Magnificat. Um, and so we're going to read that this morning. In Luke 1, chapter, Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55, it says this, And Mary said, or Mary sings, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And he was looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arms. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in his remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. In this text, Mary is saying, right before this, she says, yes, right? Use me how you will, Lord. And then she starts to sing this beautiful song where she names how God is mightier and bigger than anything we could ever imagine. It says, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud. He has filled the hungry. He has sent the rich away empty. The story of Christmas takes all of our expectations and turns it on his head, on its head, right? No one in the Christmas story 
what they expect to happen does not happen, right? Not a single person has their expectations met. If you look at Elizabeth, right? She's not expecting in her old age to be able to have a son. If you look at Joseph, an angel appears to him in a dream, right? After he finds out his fiance is about to have a baby and he's like, whoa, wait, that's not possible. We haven't done the thing we have to do to make a baby because we're not married yet. So he's gonna dismiss her quietly. And the angel comes and says to him, no, Joseph, this is the son of God. This is Emmanuel. This is God with us. And then if you look at Mary, same sort of thing, right? She's this young, poor girl. She's engaged to, to marry Joseph and all of a sudden she becomes pregnant and doesn't know quite what to do. And then in the midst of all of that, you have a person in power who wants to, to reign fully, right? And his lordship is challenged by this baby. No one in the Christmas story has their expectations met. Not even us reading it today have our expectations met. Because when we read a story like this, we imagine a king would be born in a castle. That's why the wise men went to the palace, right? Looking for the newborn king. But when they got there, they realized, no, the baby is in a lowly manger because there was no room for them. That's the story of Christmas. And it's a story that should fill our hearts with joy because sometimes our expectations, when they're not met, we can see the fullness of God around us. This isn't the only song of joy that's sung. If you, if you read on in Luke, we hear not only people singing, but we hear the heavenly host singing as well. In Luke 2, uh, verses 8 through 15, it says this, In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And then the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. For you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the child wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And then suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying or singing, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among them whom God favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place which the Lord has made known to us. Mary sings, the angels sing. We all join in this heavenly singing. But here's the thing. Even though they're singing songs of joy, not everything around them is necessarily good, right? There's still this looming threat of this all-powerful King Herod, right? Like saying, let's go kill all the babies, if you read in Luke, it says they just returned to Nazareth. But if you read in Matthew, do you remember what happens to, to the, the holy family? Do you remember where they go? Yeah, right? They flee to Egypt. They don't even get to go back home. They have to flee to another country. They're immigrants who are scared for their lives. They have to go to a new place so they can get away from danger. There's a whole lot of bad stuff going on in this story. I don't know about you, but if I was like unexpectedly pregnant, not by the man I loved, thinking, man, this is some weird stuff going on. And then I had to like go to my fiance's hometown miles and miles away, and I did not have a comfy car to drive in, right? But I had to ride on some sort of animal or in like the back of a cart or whatever. And then I got to his family's house and they were like, yeah, our house is kind of small and there's all these people here and you're kind of loud when you give birth. So you can't really be in the middle of the living room with all of us. You need to go like outside to the front lawn. And then we don't have a cute little bassinet for you right? We're just going to give you this little stone trough thing that the cows eat out of. You can put your baby there. It's totally sanitary. It'll be fine. 
And then, you know, I know you just had this baby, but this king, he wants to come kill it. That does not sound like a very joyful story, right? That's absolutely terrifying. And yet, there is singing. Because there's joy in what is possible with God. The word joy, um, I think the Sunday school class was going to look at this this morning, but you guys didn't get, get to, to watch the little video. So I'm going to say, I'm going to repeat some stuff, but it's not repeat because you guys didn't watch it. Um, but there are um, lots of words that, that we kind of associate as being synonymous with joy. Things like happy or, or cheerful. Um, and in the English, you know, we kind of have these synonymous words. The same thing is true in the Bible, right? There are different words um, that mean related things, but they kind of give us different meaning. That's true in both the Hebrew um, in the Old Testament and also the, the Greek in the New. If we kind of start with some of the, the sources of joy in the Bible, um, we hear on page one, in Genesis, that God said the world is very good, right? And so there, there's joy in the good things in life. In Psalm 104, um, it says, a good bottle of wine is a gift from God to bring joy to people's hearts. People find joy in all sorts of places, right? Right? People find joy on Christmas morning when they're with their family. They find joy when they welcome a new child into their household. They find joy maybe when they get a promotion at work or they're finally able to upgrade their rundown vehicle, right? There's all sorts of places we might find joy. But there's a specific kind of biblical joy that we find when the people of God are suffering. Because humanity is not always joyful, right? Anyone else like find that there's some things that just don't feel very joyful? And this is true in the story of God's people. If we look at the story of the Israelites, right? They have to flee and, 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 and be, be fled or be, be released from captivity and, and slavery in Egypt. With this promise that they're going to go to the promised land, and then they end up wandering around for 40 years. Which is probably longer than a lot of their lifespans, right? But yet, in the midst of all of that, the Bible says that the people have joy. The people have joy. This is the kind of biblical joy that we're talking about. And Jesus is the author of that joy. Whatever's going on in our lives, even when things aren't what we expect them to be, we're called to have this sense of joy and peace in our lives. At the end of the story of the Grinch, what I love the most is it's very, the, the ending's very short, Right? We get this long buildup of evil and demise. <laughs> and then the redemption story is pretty quick. But on that very last page, it tells us that even the Grinch did what? Do you remember the last line? Carved the roast beast, right? Not beef, beast. I don't know what a roast beast is. Um, but it says he carved the roast beast. You know, when you go into your Christmas celebrations, uh, there may be some places you don't want to go like maybe your in-law's house. Uh, there may be some people around that table that you're not super excited to gather with. Maybe like a crazy drunken uncle, I don't know. <laughs> there may be folks that you just aren't excited about. And I'm sure the Who's felt that way too, right? They were not excited about this Grinch guy that had just stolen their Christmas. And yet, they come to the table together. That's the story of redemption. That's the story of Christmas. That even in the midst of struggle and strife, we can still sing songs of joy and we can still love our neighbor. Jackson read for us a text this morning from Romans. And I'm going to close with that um, because for me, this is the meaning of Christmas. Paul writes this. He says, beloved, 
Never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies, like the Grinch, if they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals to their heads. Do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Oh God, I give you thanks for this story of Christmas. And for this reminder, oh God, of what true joy is. God, on this season, allow us to be fully reconciled back to you and with one another. God, take whatever is in our hearts that might be evil or worrisome, God, and fill us with joy. Allow us to overcome all the evil in the world by continuing to do good. We pray this in your heavenly name. Amen.